Hey everyone, welcome or welcome back to Wingo Bar Gaming. Today I've got another utterly pointless comparison for you. I'll be looking at the arcade and Saturn versions of Salamander 2. If you don't know this game, it's the sequel to the classic Konami shooter or shmup, oh. Salamander, which you may know better as Life Force in some other territories. Guest starring in today's episode, My Severe Allergies. Sorry about the nasally voice, but you're just gonna have to deal with it. Anyway, spec comparison doesn't make too much sense here, so we'll forgo that part and just talk about the game itself. Konami released Salamander 2 into the arcades in 1996, which was a whopping 10 years after the original game. You might be thinking, wait a minute, Salamander and Life Force never had a sequel. If you think that, well, you're wrong! This game ran on the Konami GX board, which is probably most famous for the two Parodius games that ran on it. Anyway, the GX uses a 32-bit Motorola 68EC020 as its CPU, has four independent background layers, alpha blending for transparencies, and can show lots of colors and sprites. Salamander 2 looks and plays well, but even though it's a fun game, it's just missing that spark that the original had, and it wasn't nearly as original as the first game was. Now we still switch between horizontally and vertically scrolling levels, but now there are only two vertical stages, and the rest are horizontal. The big gimmick this time around is that you can launch an option and use it as a bomb. There's also a new weapon named the Twin Laser, and every weapon can be temporarily powered up. They also have option seeds now, which are sort of like baby options, and if you get two of them, they become a full option. You can also cycle between two types of missiles, and there's a force field too. It's a really nice and ultimately forgettable game. Salamander 2 never came home to any system as a standalone title, but it did find its way into three separate compilations that were only released in Japan, including the Salamander Deluxe Pack Plus for the Sega Saturn, which is the other version of the game we'll be seeing today. This same compilation was released for the PlayStation as well, but it came out on the Saturn a few weeks earlier, on June 19, 1997, versus July 6, 1997 for the PlayStation game. Both games contain a port of Arcade Salamander, Arcade Life Force, and Arcade Salamander 2. What's the difference between Salamander and Life Force? Well, Arcade Life Force uses a Gradius-like token power-up system instead of the immediate pickups of Arcade Salamander, and it features some redone graphics and different music here and there. Think of Arcade Life Force as sort of like a DLC pack that reskins the game and modifies some gameplay elements. Anyway, Salamander 2 on this compilation for the Saturn is pretty close to Arcade Perfect, but not quite. But the differences this time around, folks, are minor, as you will see. As far as recording methodology for this one, one important note first. For Arcade Salamander 2, I recorded the footage you're about to see in main. So if that bothers you, just go ahead and stop the video right now. But the reason I bring it up today is that this game has some graphical glitches in MAME versus running it on real hardware, and I'll point those out as they occur. I also used a few save states in the Saturn version, mainly at the start of levels if I thought the gameplay diverged too far from what I had recorded in advance in the arcade version. Alright, let's get on with it. While I don't normally show the intros to these things, I figured, eh, why not? It's kind of interesting this time. So I'll show you the attract mode and both the uh, Saturn and Arcade versions here. The Saturn version also has a nice little, you know, segue into the menu for the game. Alright, here we are. We're about to start. Here's our intro, where you can see... One of the snake enemies looks sort of like Cruiser Tetron from the original, just flying around. Or Intruder, depending on which version you go by. We get some nice FMV on both. And it leads into our title screen. For some reason, it had been a little while since I've played this game, and I thought they Fire on the arcade one was animated on the title screen, but I guess I was wrong there. Oh well. So here we are underway with actual gameplay. And as you can see, hey, we've got transparencies on the Saturn. I guess the Saturn can do some after all, right? It's funny, after the last video, I still had some people saying that they were amazed that the Saturn couldn't do transparencies. But it depends on what you're doing. It handles these just fine. Anyway, Salamander 2, as you can tell from the era it's in, we were 
you know, just getting out of the 16-bit era in the arcades. Well, this runs on a 32-bit, you know, board in the arcade on Konami's GX hardware. The Saturn handles all the effects and everything that this game does without any issues whatsoever. And we see nice little effects, like uh, before the when we had the transparency, we also had some line scrolling and things like that. Now we've got lots of stuff moving on the screen all at once in both versions of the game. We have a nice level of detail in both, and up to this point, I mean, you'd be really hard-pressed to find any significant difference between the two versions of the game. I mean, the audio balance uh, for the music and sound and everything is a bit different in the Saturn version. The one odd thing I'll note about the audio on the Saturn version is it seems almost like it's going through some sort of low-pass filter. Uh, it just doesn't sound quite as clear as the arcade game. One minorly annoying thing I will mention in the game itself is that it's got a lot more RNG, uh, so the power-ups are not always the same. Uh, they're not always in the same place. So your experience through Salamander 2 could be vastly different each time you play it. If that's something that, you know, you enjoy, that gets you going, well, there you are, you know, have fun with it. For me, I don't mind a little bit of randomness, but I wish there was a little bit more consistency so you could maybe better prepare for certain situations and certain boss fights. Now, I do love how we had our little cameo from the Brain Boss from the original Salamander slash Life Force, and this thing just ate it. <laughs> I don't want to gloss over that. And then we get to destroy this thing. Now, you can get a real quick kill here. I actually did the first time I recorded this for the arcade. I got rid of it because it was too much of a pain to replicate it on the Saturn. But you can launch an option in, you know, use it as a bomb, and then if you time a second option launch just right, you can destroy it before the first time it lunges at you. Alright, now here we are in our first overhead level. Uh, so much like the original Salamander slash Life Force, we have both side-scrolling scenes and overhead vertically scrolling scenes. Now there's only two of these scenes in the arcade and Saturn versions of Salamander 2. While in the original Salamander slash Life Force, it alternated every other level. Here we get four side-scrolling levels and two vertical. And what's a little bit annoying here, and this is part of the issue with Salamander 2, there's not a whole lot of background interactivity in much of the game. And here, I mean, there basically is no background. You're on a star field, and there are these weird, round, spherical, planetoid-type things. Some of them, you know, shoot flames. Uh, and in this one, you can actually hit the flames to kind of push them back so that they, uh, they don't get you, unlike the flames in, say, the third stage in, you know, Life Force or the original Salamander. Still, it's just kind of not enough here. <laughs> There's just too much. You're on blank space except for that. This is like the one interesting part of a level where you've got to work your way around this one while taking out its fire and uh, making sure that it doesn't hit you. And on the Saturn, you can see there's the new weapon, there's the twin laser, and in the arcade, I've got the standard ripple laser. Uh, never liked the ripple laser. Never been a fan of that. Anyway, here is our boss. This one is kind of a pain because it's easy, yet I somehow still manage to often get killed on this boss at least once. You can pretty much just launch your options into it and go nuts at the start if you want, uh, but the problem with that is it's a risk-reward system, right? So you waste all your options, then you lose a bunch of your firepower. So you've got to decide, you know, what's better, having the extra firepower longer or getting that instantaneous satisfaction of, you know, maybe blowing up a head or two from a single option burst. So th that's the major gameplay mechanic you know, that this game employs. And then after, you know, that option attack, you know, that option bomb, it leaves behind one of the option seeds, which are these little ones that I just picked up there. When you get two option seeds, they become a full option. And when it's a seed, all it does is circle around you and fire a small little shot every now and then. All right, so here's our first real big noticeable glitch in Maine. The colors are wrong in the arcade version here. And do you see how the foreground layer is transparent in the arcade version on the, the left? It's not supposed to be like that. It's supposed to be solid like the Saturn version on the right. And the only thing that's supposed to be transparent in the background here are the, the mucusy webs that are in the background. But meanwhile, more things are transparent, you know, in the glitched MAME version that you're seeing here. 
And this level, definitely reminiscent of something from the first Life Force. And you can see there's two different forms of missile power-ups in this game. Uh, this one that I've got in both versions right now, when we're on uh, horizontal levels, shoots both up towards the ceiling and down towards the floor, but the missiles just vanish once they hit anything, you know, including the scenery. The other type of missile is the standard Gradius type, uh, where they only aim diagonally down, but they trace along the path of the floor. There was another glitch in the arcade version, if you didn't see it, the background didn't fade out correctly. And then once again, we've got things pretty similar here. These are sort of reminiscent of some things we've seen in different Gradius games, particularly the first and third ones. And we are making our way to the boss of Stage 3. There are some very minor color differences here, but honestly, I can't remember anymore if these are hardware differences or if this is just an emulation problem with the main version. Now this boss can either be really hard or really easy. You come in here with all your power-ups, then it's super easy to take him out and not even use an option bomb. If you come in here weakened or you take a death, you know, you lose a power-up, you can use the bombs on it, uh, but they're a little imprecise there and it's still kind of a pain no matter what. Alright, here we are in stage 4, and guess what? There are some pretty big differences here that you might not notice on that planet. On the Saturn version, it looks like it's got extra JPEG artifacting and fewer colors. If you look at some of the craters especially, you can see they're smoother in the arcade original than they are in the Saturn version. If you don't see it right now, don't worry. As soon as this game is done, I'm going to show you a few close-ups of some of the differences here, so you can see that I'm not crazy, and those things really are like that. <laughs> but we'll do that at the very end. Now once again, other than that color difference issue on the planet, things are very, very similar here. And I do think there are a few more minor color differences, things might be a little bit brighter in certain parts on the ships on the Saturn version, but other than that, it's so close that, you know, you might as well for all intents and purposes consider these the same. But here's another glitch in the MAME emulation uh, right now. So you see that cannon on the side of the ship that fires up lasers? In the arcade version, we're seeing the lasers behind the ship that it's on, while in the uh, Saturn version, it's in front. It's supposed to be in front. That's a glitch in the emulation here. Kind of strange that some of these glitches are still there, but... You know, nothing but respect for the emulator authors. I know this hardware, some of it's not all that well documented, and a lot of things they have to kind of estimate and guess at to get things working as well as they do. And it's great that they got this game working. And Salamander 2, in general, is one that I feel is not super well known, especially since we never had you know, a real full home release of any version uh, here in the US. And I've also you know, played and have the Japanese PSP collection uh, for Salamander, which has a few additional games on it. That one, you know, that one might be the best one to play, just because I think it's got the most options from what I can remember. But the Saturn version here is really nice, and everything it lets you do, you know, all the additions that I mentioned, such as, you know, letting you choose the, uh, you know, the button configuration, whether you want one or two fire buttons, whether you want auto-fire on one or both of the fire buttons if you set it up with two. You know, all those things are nice, and there's extra configuration options too, like difficulty, and one more that I'll talk about at the end here. So this boss, again, very reminiscent of a boss that we've seen in prior Life Force slash Salamander slash Gradius games. This one's got a little bit of a different spin on it, no pun intended, in that it reverses directions uh, with its arms every so often. I almost got it uh, taken out here. I honestly don't remember if I took it out legitimately, or if uh, it timed out. <laughs> I think it timed out. Most of these bosses in the Salamander and Gradius games have sort of a, a mercy uh, method where if you take too long, they just die. Uh, anyway, here is our fifth level. This is our penultimate level in the game. If you're a fan of Gradius 5 on PlayStation 2, this might look very familiar to you. 
but this game predates that one by quite a bit. So we've got a nice big chunky asteroid field, whole bunch of asteroids. When you blow one up, especially larger ones, they uh, break into smaller pieces, much like the asteroids in the game Asteroids. Yeah, that was fun to say. Anyway, so as we go on here, with this level, I don't really see anything particularly notable uh, difference-wise between the two versions. I couldn't exactly remember the path I took when I played the arcade one first, so we're not going to see identical paths. But, in a way, that's also kind of good, because you get to see a little bit more of the level than you would, you know, even on a normal playthrough at this point. And this one is harder, the enemies fire a lot more, and this is another one of those Konami games where it adjusts the uh, difficulty slightly based on how powered up you are. So, you'll see the more power-ups you have, the more shots the enemies fire, and also, at times, the faster their shots will be. So if you want to have an easier time, keep your power-ups to kind of a minimum. That will also be less fun, but, you know, that's how you can game the system a bit if you want. Alright, we're approaching the boss of this level. And this twin laser, once you've got it powered up, it's just awesome. <laughs> it gets really, really strong. And you can see you can take out that first thing. You may not realize the first time that you get here, or the first couple of times, that you can destroy that. But yes, you can destroy that thing entirely. And then the rest of the time here, we're just going to be blowing up gates and then shooting it in the eye, as they love to say in all of the Gradius slash Gradius games. So on the Saturn, I was a lot more efficient, took it out a lot quicker. Well, not that much more efficient, I guess. A little more efficient. And here we go into our second overhead level, which is the final level of the entire game. So for this level, again, it's really basic. There's not a ton of background interactivity. And the only ones that really have a good amount, I would say, are probably, you know, stages four and five. Uh, so, when we saw those, there were lots of opportunities to crash into the background, and the background did different things. You know, I, I guess three also. So we've got good backgrounds that are interactive through about half of these levels. And also six levels for a game like this, released in 1996, definitely a bit short. I know the original only had six levels also, uh, but, you know, in, in that one, they had an excuse, it was 1986 when they made it. This was made ten years later on much more powerful hardware. And this was also made where limits on things like memory and stuff like that uh, were a lot less restrictive than they were in 1986. They could have easily added another couple of levels to this game. I really should have had, I think, one more overhead and one more uh, side scrolling. And the overhead, if they would have added another one, should have had a lot more solid backgrounds and stuff. But the biggest problem with Salamander 2 here is not that it's not a good proficient game. It is. There's a lot of stuff on the screen at points. I mean, look at this section here. That's an awful lot of stuff. And we're seeing even more on the Saturn than we do in the arcade original. And it handles it with ease. There's not a hint of slowdown or anything like that at all here. But this game was not in any way innovative at the point that it came out. And Konami's best Gradius games, they all did something original. The first Salamander slash Life Force was very original, you know, in a lot of ways. The, you know, shifting of scrolling of perspective from side view to overhead in that game was very unique for a shooter that was released at that point. In this one, there have been quite a few other ones that have, you know, utilized that gimmick over the years. Some of them a lot better than this one does. And it just, it doesn't have anything that stands out or that screams, hey, you've got to play me, I do this so cool. And one of the more annoying things in it is I don't like that you can't control your speed and that you have to get the speed ups. Because once you die in this game, you're so slow it makes it really hard to recover and get more power-ups. So you can see I took a lot of deaths there, you know, on the Saturn in particular, you know, just because of my ship being too slow to dodge some of these things. 
Same thing in the arcade here. You could see it coming sometimes, but you're just too slow to react to it. And that's not fun. They could have added a speed meter. This game only uses one button normally. So they could have added a speed meter and just let you control the speed of your ship at will with a button press or two. Now here we have a part that is reminiscent of the final escape from the end of the original Salamander slash Life Force. Except we're not quite done yet here. See, in the arcade I did it like a master. In the Saturn I collided with one of the things by maybe just a millimeter or so missing the gap. Oh well, what can you do? Here's our final boss, who likes to talk to us for some reason. This guy really loves to shoot his mouth off. We'll do it again at the end, just before we kill him. This is one of the more annoying bosses in the game, but he's not so bad. You just have to really be aware of all the different attack methods he has, and the positioning of your ship. And if you don't have at least one speed up here, you're probably going to die at least a couple of times. You know, especially when he shoots out those round bullets like this with the trails. Those things are slightly homing, they're not entirely homing. But if you're anywhere near them when they're shifting angles, when you're super slow, you can't avoid it. Uh, and that's just, that's frustrating. That's not fun. I don't think speed should be a reward. We've almost got him in both versions here. Here we are seeing... His next attack that he does once the fight has gone on for a little bit and he gets weakened. Shoots out these little rings that sometimes have those little circular pulsing bullets in them. Again, there's no especially noticeable differences that I see here on this part between the two different versions of the game. If you see anything noticeable, hey, go ahead and shout it out and let me know in the comments. Alright, and there's his final threat as he dies. I don't really feel like going to hell with him, so let's get out of here. And there we are, making our escape, and oh, look at that, the stars are different in both versions. They're sort of lime green in the Saturn version, versus the more white of the arcade one. And Player 2's red ship is a lot blockier on the Saturn in the ending sequence than it was on the arcade original. And if you missed it, don't worry. Uh, during the final section here, where I give you my final thoughts on the game, I will show you some screenshots with close-ups so you can see exactly what I was talking about. And I captured these screenshots directly uh, from this comparison. They are not edited in any way. So this is exactly what it looks like. I didn't change this stuff. This stuff was there. You just may not have seen it the first time. So anyway, as you can see, our credits are quite a bit different between the two games. They're not too much longer on this one either. One other neat thing I'll mention about Salamander 2 is after you finish the game, you'll start a second loop. And then during the second loop, it plays Life Force music, at least in the first stage. So it's also harder, and once you die and lose all your lives in loop 2, it doesn't allow you to continue. Now, here is another awesome thing with the Saturn version. After you complete a loop, you can start on the next loop from the title screen of the game. So for example, after you've completed loop 1 and you've started loop 2, even if you die immediately after, you can start at loop 2 right from the start screen. Oh, and here is our final difference. The Konami logo is a lot darker on the Saturn version. Also, it's lower on the screen. Why for both of those things? I don't know. Alright, so there you are, a complete playthrough comparison of the arcade and Saturn versions of Salamander 2. While they are extremely similar, here are a few final thoughts on this one. Now, the case of Salamander 2 is one where I'd recommend the home versions over the arcade original for a few reasons. First off, at the moment, since the arcade version's emulation still has issues in MAME, the experience you get playing that version is just slightly marred. Second, the home versions have more options. On the Saturn version here, for example, as I mentioned, you can choose whether to use one or two fire buttons. You can also choose to have independent auto-fire on either of those buttons. Or you can set it to just use one button and set it up to turbo for one-button gameplay goodness. 
Also, you can select the difficulty of the game, and then, as I just mentioned, after you finish the game on Saturn, you can choose which loop to start at. Yes, there are a few things on Saturn where the visuals are slightly, slightly worse uh, than the arcade original throughout the game, and as I mentioned earlier in the video, the sound quality is also not quite quite as good, it's not quite as clear as the arcade version on the Saturn, but it's a pretty minor difference, and if you weren't listening to them one after the other right next to each other like in this video, most people probably wouldn't even notice. You'd have to be a real stickler to dismiss it just because of those extremely minor differences. And while I may have a reputation for being a bit of a stickler, even I'm not that much of a stickler. Play the Saturn PS1 or PSP versions of Salamander 2 in one of their respective collections for the best experience you can get in the year 2024, so far at least. Alright, and here are some of those still shots I told you I was going to show you at the end. So here, if we look at this one, you can see that the planet in the background definitely has more color and less artifacting in the arcade original than in the uh, Saturn port. And then if I zoom in on this crater down here, sort of in the bottom left, you can see it's a really kind of big noticeable difference. And I can tell you, I didn't have to zoom in to see the difference myself. This is one case where I noticed it immediately playing this version after the arcade one. And then here's another one I wanted to show you screenshots of. So this is during the end sequence, and you can see once again we've got got lime green stars in the Saturn version versus the more white ones of the arcade original. At least I think they're lime green, that's what Mrs. Inglebard tells me. Remember, I'm colorblind. And then also Player 2's red ship, for some reason, is way more pixely and less detailed on Saturn. Look at these in a close-up! That's a pretty huge difference! Why is it so different? I have no idea. Just one of those things that gives you something to talk about, I guess. So tell me, was this your first time seeing any version of Salamander 2? Were you a fan of the original Salamander or Life Force? Did you ever try this one? Do you want to give it a try? Tell me all about your experience and your opinions on this game in the comments. And that'll do it for this video, my retro gaming friends. If you enjoyed it, please like it and share it online somewhere. If you haven't yet, subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so you'll never miss one of my videos. If you want to support the work that I do here, you can do that on Patreon or Ko-fi, or right here on YouTube through channel memberships and things like thanks. With that, I'll say thanks for watching, and see me later.